This is Donald Boyd, and I'm going to tell you some of my memories from Wolford Palmer Boyd and Rosie Ettinger Boyd, who married and had ten children. Uh, first of all, I can say that the Boyd clan was not a close-knit clan, as Grammy and Granddad Boyd never seen all their children at one time. Uh, Grandfather Boyd was a, a travel man. He went west as a young man, worked in the grain fields, the wheat fields, learned how to use a scythe and use it well. Uh, he came back and he lived in, in Windsor Forks and, and now a place called Mount Martic. Mart talk as they call it sorry uh, at that time he worked in the woods and also worked as a mailman and from there he moved down to Marty almost a three mile plains on the back road uh, with his family at that time uh, which would be Lena Ruth and Ob. I don't know about Les. Uh, I think he did. Les was there. Anyway, uh, then there was Harold and, and or Hensley, Harold, and Hanny, the three H's. So. Hensley was probably there for a while, but he joined the service very shortly after we got to, to his point. And from, from that point on, he worked on the farm. He worked in the gypsum company when he bought the farm, but then when he got the farm, he, he stayed there and worked. Raised cattle, lumbered in the winter time, cut enough firewood for the kitchen stove plus the stove in the front room for the winter. Raised pigs, chickens, and sheep at one time. And as I remember, the sheep they were the hardest animal to keep inside of a fence. They, they seem to have a genius way of getting out. Of it. Anyway, uh, from that, I'll tell you that he set up all nights when the pig was about to have little ones with him so that the pig wouldn't step on them, lay on them, or whatever. So, because there'd be approximately a dozen or more little ones running around uh, had dike land out next to the Avon River and I I'm searching for a word that's why I'm staggering along here to describe them uh, I hate the word use the word cruel or mean because I don't think he was mean in the sense of given money or anything away like that. But animals feared him. When he walked out the back of the barn door and the animals would be a, a kilometer away pinned there and he would holler, co-boss, co-boss, co-boss. And by the time he said the third co-boss, those cows' heads were up. And he would call them three more times and they would head for the barn. Now, my cousin or brother Roly, as we refer to each other, we would try to imitate his voice and call the cows, and they wouldn't even lift their heads for us. So there was something in Granddad's voice that, that the animals knew, you don't fool with this guy. We had feeding the pigs, you had to walk by the hen house, and we had a rooster there that would come out and just charge you and spur you. And 
you end up giving him a kick. And he'd go about 10 feet in the air and land, and when he hit the ground, he was coming back. And he kept that up until you get by the hen house. But when my grandfather boy walked out there, he just looked at that rooster and said, if you touch me, you'll never see the light of day. And that rooster would circle him about five feet away, all the way by the hen house. But never, ever come near. So the animals knew there was something about him. And like I said, I don't like to use the word cruel, but he had that sense about him when it come to the animals. They paid attention. Whether it was a dog, I tried to get a dog out of my father's car one time because Johnny Redden wanted to take it somewhere. Uh, my mother and father, I think, had his car to Prince Edward Island. And I couldn't get him out. He reached in, boy, and he bared his teeth and snarled and would jump at you. And my grandfather just walked up and said, get out of here. You get out and reached in and grabbed him by the collar and brought him out. Uh, and the dog never touched him, never even tried to touch him once he seen who it was. So, like I say, there was something there. Also, things that have happened to me with him, and I guess I have to include my father because they worked together on the farm, that uh, we would be in the bush cutting down firewood trees. And they would notch the tree and then without moving, switch hands on their axe and cut it down. And I would try that, and I'd notch the tree good. But boy, do you think I could get the axe to work when I switched hands? So I had to walk around the tree and cut it down from the other side. And my father and grandfather both said, you know, men stand in one spot and cut the tree down. Beavers walk around and around the tree to get it down. And I was 30 years old before I realized why I could because they never told you anything. They just figured you, you had to be smart enough to find out on your own, and apparently I wasn't. That, that when you notched a tree, you notched it with the wrong hand. Like, I'm right-handed, so you notch it left-handed, and then cut it down right-handed, and there was no sweat. But I didn't find that out until long after I was helping them. And that, that was the way you learned everything on the farm from them. They, they didn't bother telling you. They figured you had to be smart enough. You seen them do it. You had to know how to do it. Anyway, he, he always was good to me and he was good to Roly, I know. And I heard that, you know, when Rosie finished school and wanted to go to Montreal, she said, you know, like, Pop, uh, you give everybody money when they get married. and I'm not getting married, but I want to move to Montreal. Could you give me some money? And that was done. Uh, Roland needed money to go to New Brunswick to get had a job there waiting for him. And he lent him the money. And a neighbor had, had seen him do it and said, do you think you'll get that money back? And my grandfather said, I don't know, but if I don't get it back, I won't have to lend him any more money. And that was the way he was. He, If you asked him for money or something, uh, he'd give it to you. But if you didn't pay it back, don't bother asking for anything again because you just wouldn't get it. Uh, what else can I say about him? Uh, I think if I talk too much about him, it's going to show how dumb I was because uh, Roly and I were acting a fool at the kitchen table one time and he thought we were making fun of him I guess. He grabbed a stick of kindling and come over and we knew he was going to hit us and Roly put his arm up over his head and got hit on the arm but I didn't bother putting my arm up but I got hit on the head so I guess Roland was off a lot smarter than I was so I like I said it probably keeps showing how dumb I've been all my life that way. And so he, the 10 kids they had were 
were uh, six boys and four girls. There was, it was, the family was splitting high. They say we got Indian blood in us, and three of the boys were dark complected, and three were light complected. Uh, Leslie, Obe, and Harold were all dark complected, but uh, Wilfred Arthur, and who was called Jack, and Terry, and Hensley were light complected. So, and the girls were divided too. There was two dark complected and two light complected. So, like I say, the family was divided in that respect. But uh, I think I'll change now and go to the oldest boy, which was Wolford. Arthur. The family called him Arthur, and everybody else called him Jack, I guess. Uh, I have no idea why he was called Jack, but anyway, he was. He had three children by his first wife and five by his second, so he totally had eight children. Uh, I don't know much about him. I, as far as my memory goes, I can only remember seeing him three times in my life. Uh, so I can remember Rolly's mother better. But uh, anyway, uh, th those some of those families are going to have to give you an update on Jack because I can't give you much. The next was Sadie. And Sadie lived in Montreal and was married there. Uh, during the Second World War, when all when the boys were in Ontario or wherever, it, uh, army camps or whatever, they used to go over to Montreal and stay with Sadie and her husband. And when I, in 1956, with my wife Carol, decided to move to Ontario, we had a five or six hour layover at the train station in Montreal and we phoned. Sadie and, and her husband Claire came and picked us up, and I recognized them, and I still don't know why I recognized them, whether I'd seen a lot of pictures of them or whether I'd actually met them before that. But anyway, when when he come into the train station, he, I seen this guy standing looking around, and he turned towards me, and I waved at him and said, Claire, and, and so he came over. They treated us royally. And then that's when I realized why all her brothers went and visited them when they were in the army, because they must have got treated the same way I did. Uh, Sadie had two children, a boy and a girl. I forget the girl's name, but the boy's name is Jim. Uh, I only seen them a couple of times, the boy and girl. Uh, so. Once again, they're going to have to give you fill you in on Sadie better than I can. The next was Terry, my father. Now, Terry was a uh, oh, well, he was a hard worker. He made sure all the equipment on the farm was oiled and what have you when the winter time comes, so that would come next spring you just get to go and, and hook onto it and start plowing or harrowing or whatever or and if it was a manure spreader you could take it out and start spreading manure because everything was well oiled in grease uh he had an old 30 shav that i think less bought i'm not sure but anyway he went in the army my father kept it and he had three engines for it he had a summer one and a winter one, and then he had one to use for emergencies during the summer or winter when one of them let down. He had a tripod set up in the yard where he'd push the car under and hook onto the motor and lift it out, then push the car out under underneath and, and put it in a wheelbarrow and wheel it somewhere and fix it. So he, he was very mechanically inclined that way. Uh, also, you know, he he had he loved hunting and fishing. 
Uh, he supplied us with deer meat every year uh, and fish. Not as much, but he, he always come home with fish when he went out. And But the, every year he got his two deer that he was allowed to get, he would get them. But he told me stories about when he was a kid that the last year in the 30s when the moose season was open at that time, uh, him and somebody else went out and shot a moose. And he carried, when they, him and the, his buddy carried moose home, the other people had to go back and get the rest of it. And he said they all complained about how much load they had until they waited all the night, carried the biggest load of meat out. So he always was look excellent physical condition, except that he didn't have much of a heart, his heart go, because it was all honeycomb when he died, and uh, he always has, was on heart medicine for all the life of that I know, because before, before he married my mother, he had a knot in his bowel, and they operated on it, and they wouldn't give him any chloroform or anything, they just froze. And of course, when they, he said when they got it opened, it really hurt. And and of course, in those times, they had you know like a twelve inch cut. And so I I don't know. I think he had to be pretty tough that way. He got called for the army, and they always in the letter you got a ticket from wherever you were on the train or a pass. I guess it would be more than a ticket to. Halifax, so he got on the train to Windsor and went to Halifax, and he was going through the line, and you know they were checking him out and everything, and then he got to where the the doctors were when the doctor laid a stethoscope on his hand, on his heart. There, he called every other doctor in the building, and they checked him. They give him taxi fare back to the train station because his heart was so bad at that time. They asked him what he did, and he said, "I'm a farmer." And the one doctor said, well, if you raise chickens for a living, make your wife gather the eggs. And I, he lived to be 43 years old. Uh, so he lived about 10 years after that or more. I don't know, it be 57. He died, so it would be more about 15 years maybe. So he had a pretty good life, even though he, you know, at the end, he just couldn't maneuver anywhere. He couldn't walk from the house. Well, he walked the house, the road at the mailbox, and there was a big rock by the mailbox. He could get the mail and sit there and rest before he could turn around and walk back to the house. So he, it was pretty hard on him. But he, he loved the woods. We, he, I can remember when I was, I don't know, five years old, somewhere in there, we went to a guides meet, which was uh, quite a contest. They did log rolling and stand on the edge of the canoe and bounce it up and down and race canoes and stuff. Uh, I can remember they had a kangaroo that would box, and somebody was boxing with a kangaroo. And at that time, of course, I didn't know how dangerous it could be to be around a kangaroo because they wouldn't bother boxing you with the front feet. They'd kick you with the back feet, and that was that was really not good. Uh, I forgot to tell you, Arthur had got called for the military too, but he was working in in Quebec at uh, Shawinigan Falls Power Dam, and he was a head engineer there. So the government said, "No, you don't have to go. You're working for this project." And so from there, after that. When his wife passed away, he went to South America, so he didn't get involved with the war at all, and neither did my father. So after my father, come was Hanny. Now, Hanny was another one. She was also in Montreal for a while. She had did, uh, I guess, almost like nursing work with a, a sick person in Falmouth, uh, and while she was there. I guess it was her son. More more or less, I guess we would say he fell in love with Hanny, and when she left, 
he he wrote her and tried to talk her into coming back, but then he I guess from what I hear he went to Montreal and convinced her that he was serious enough to come back and and he had two boys, Jim and uh, Francis. So they're going to have to fill you in some on, on their mother. But I used to go, well, Carol and I and the family used to go back to Nova Scotia every year. And we'd stop and stay at her parents. And uh, so I would take a trip around the loop from Windsor over through Falmouth across Sangster's Bridge to Windsor Forks and back down the back road to see what family I could see on one day. And I always made sure when I got to Hanny's place, it was close to lunchtime because no matter what, you'd have had to stay for lunch, whether you were two hours early or, or two minutes early. And uh, so I always did that. And then after her husband passed away and later years, Carol used to come with me. And one day we were there and she said, Don, come and see how I fixed up the bedroom. Now, I don't remember whether Carol went with me or not. But anyway, I went in and she was showing me everything. And over the head of her bed was this big picture. And she said, that's, that's father and mother there. And I looked at that and instantly knew I wanted them. So I said to her, Hanny, if you ever decide to get rid of that picture, I want it. And she said, okay, Donald. So about a year or two later, she was showing me around the house again, and we looked in her bedroom, and I said, don't forget, Hanny, if you ever decide you don't want that picture, I want it. And okay, Donald. So about two or three years later, when they sold, she sold the place and moved in with her son Francis into the basement. So we found out where Francis lived and went and uh, knocked on the door, and she answered the door. And, oh, hi. Well, nice to see you. I heard you were home, and come on down. So I, as we're walking down the stairs, she said, I got something for you. And I had no idea what she was going to give me. But anyway, she goes off into this side room, had a lot of her stuff there, and picked out this picture and gave it to me. She said, here, you can have this now. I haven't got room for it, and I know you want it, so you take it and take good care of it. Well, I was, I am still impressed by this picture. Uh, my oldest son wants it. But I told him he can have it when he decides that he can put it up in a room in the house and not hide it in the closet. So anyway, it's still at my house now. And I really, off, uh, from there, Handy started telling me stories. Stories about the family. About the three H's, as she called them. And that was... Hanny, Harold, and Hensley, but mostly it was about Terry, Hanny, and Harold, because they were close in age, but the other three were about the same. So, but anyway, she would say, Terry would tell Harold and I, let's go do this and this and this, and we sort of knew maybe we shouldn't do that, but we, we would go with them, and then we would get in trouble. And Father would come catch us and give Harold and I a licking, but he wouldn't touch Terry because Terry was sick. And she told me a lot of other stories about Terry, my father, so I never, as long as she lived, I kept visiting her and uh, getting stories about my father that I, you know, and, and I enjoyed that from her because I had no idea what he'd done when he was a kid. Really, but anyway, when he when she would say, you know, Father, give Harold and I a licking, and wouldn't touch Terry because he was sick. You could even sixty years later hear the resentment in her voice that he got away with all this, 
had heard Harold going to lick it. So, you know, it, it, it seems funny, but that that's the way the world goes, I guess. Anyway, also, next is Harold. Now, Harold uh, was married for a while, but I don't know much about Harold except that he had nightmares. Once in the woods, he hollered, the roof is falling in, the roof is falling in. He had everybody in the top box pushing on the roof, and they lifted the roof up off of the frame. And they had to take a whole day out of the log and in the woods to put the roof back on proper. And uh, and he was in the war, and he was in the Forestry Corps. But he found out the Forestry Corps wasn't going overseas. And so he changed to the tank corps, and he went over, and I'm not sure whether he was on the landing at Juno Beach or not, because it, it, he never ever said that, but what he did say was he was halfway between there and Germany when he got his tank blew up. So if he didn't come on, on that landing day, he came afterwards and, and charged through with the tank corps. And uh, so he said he tried, he had a German rifle with a telescope on it, and he was going to bring it home. And he couldn't get it out of the tank, so he took the scope off and come out. And he said the captain really gave him a heck because he could have got killed because he no more was out away from the tank when it blew up. So anyway, that's about all I heard from him, you know, about the war or anything. and then. He moved to Ontario, and uh, and Hensley moved to Ontario, and then I moved there. Well, what happened was uh, a cousin married a guy by the name of Ralph Max Minko and moved to Thorold, Ontario, and that's what started our clan west. Uh, what else can I say about Harold? He was a, a fun sort of guy. Always give us Christmas presents, even after him and his wife divorced. But uh, he had a slight heart attack, and for some reason, they said he scared himself to death, and he probably had a had a nightmare, or whatever, and and uh, it, it killed him. And he was, I guess, just in his fifties, early fifties. And uh, so anyway, that's Harold. I come to Hensley. If you look on Facebook, you'll see Faye's description of her father, which it made me smile, especially when she said about racing, because I can remember him before Faye was Faye. And he had a Hudson Terraplane while Faye was a baby, and he... The front doors opened the wrong way. If you had opened them while you were driving down the road, it would have flipped them right off because they, were open, they came open the wrong way. But anyway, he, he used to roar that thing around, and uh, it, it was fun driving with him. And uh, he taught me how to drive. And like Faye said, he, he never got mad even when she painted the car. And I want to give you an example. What kind of a thing it was. I never knew how to drive until I moved to Thorold. Bought a 48 Chef. And he taught me how to drive. And we're going back streets to Thorold. Up to between Collier Road and the main downtown street. And we're going around these blocks. And we come to a stop sign. And when we stop, he said, turn left here. And I turned. and got up the street to the next block, and there was a stop sign, and he said, turn to my left this time. And I realized then that at the last time when he said turn left, I had turned right. And it shows you that oh, he didn't holler at me when I turned right. He said, I told you to turn left or anything. He just waited to the next stop sign and said, turn to my left this time. And uh, I don't think I'll ever forget that because you know, it was funny because I looked at him and with a sheepish look on my face and grinned. And we traveled 
a lot together. Uh, we camped together, and this was after, basically after all our, all the kids were away from home. We went to Wheeling, West Virginia. We went to Nashville, Tennessee. We got Les and Gloria to come with us once or twice. Well, the six of us went once, and that was something. You know, like the six of us together, we had we had a great time. You know, like at my trailer, we stayed in the trailer, and got to all these places, and I remember we were going down seventy-seven south of seventy-seven. I think it's seventy-seven. Anyway, we're going uh, south on below eighty-one in in Virginia. And uh, I wasn't telling them. He said, where are we going? I said, ah, never mind. See, so all of a sudden, there's the exit to go up onto the Blue Ridge Parkway. So I, I'm planning on taking them from there to Pigeon Forge at Dollywood on the Blue Ridge Parkway. Well, I got up. We got up there, and you couldn't see 20 feet in front of you after we got up that high. So I... We all rolled our windows down and stuck our heads out the windows and couldn't see or hear anything. So finally I seen a sign saying, look off. And usually the look offs had, had an in and out that you just like a half moon circle to drive around on. So I said, there's another entrance there. I'm going to turn around. You guys listen for traffic. I don't want to get hit. So we... I got up there, sure enough, was the next one, and I turned around to come back. We got back, heading back, and I said, does anybody know the exit I should take to get back down on the 77? Of course, nobody knew that, including me, but it was well marked. There was a sign saying, you know, uh, north and south, 77. So we got back on the road, ended up at a campground called Hungry Mothers. And it was the only flat piece of land, I think, in Virginia. Every house and stuff was built on a hill around it. And you could tell that in the springtime or sometime, it flooded the whole campground. So, but anyway, we were there in the summer, so it wasn't flooding. But yeah, we, had a, we had a good laugh. We were going to Hungry Mother's Campground. So, but uh, we, we had a lot of good times, the six of us. So after Hensley, of course, there was Leslie. And, uh, oh, I should tell you about when I first moved to Ontario, I went back and forth to work on an old bicycle Hensley had. Why we didn't buy a new one? I had money enough to buy one. Anyway, I'd drive to work in the morning, and on the way home, it would break. So I have to go in the house and say, I got to phone my uncle to come and get me. So I, because he worked like midnight shifts, and, and I was steady days. And uh, he would come and pick me up, take the bicycle to work, and fix it, and uh, bring it home in the morning. I'd jump on it and go back to work again. And at least once a week this happened. And I still, like I say, I don't realize why I didn't buy a new one, but I didn't. And so, and Leslie now, Leslie was, he was a ball player, among other things, horseshoe play, uh, lawn, uh, darts, and washers, any, anything that was hand-eye coordination, Les was good at. And, uh, and he did it, uh, you know, regular basis, like, uh, he, him and Gloria were presidents of the, in the Legion. He was president of the men's side, and she was president of the woman auxiliary, all at the same time. And they they run that place for a while. But anyway, when Les got married, well, before he got married, he played softball, and I used to end up calling balls and strikes. Well, at that time. Nobody had anything. 
The only guy with a glove was the first baseman and the catcher. Everybody else with bare hands. No face masks for the catcher, I don't think. Anyway, everybody stood behind the pitcher to call balls and strikes. And for some reason, like I say, I wasn't too bright. I stood behind the catcher. Never got hit, so I guess it was all right for that part of it. But I used to call um, people when, when Les was pitching, they always said I favored him, but I, I didn't think so because Les didn't throw too many balls. He, he was pretty accurate with it, throwing that ball. And so anyway, for when he got married to Gloria and was building his house, he had he bored a team of horses from grandpa, his father, my grandfather, and got a scoop from somebody, what they call a scoop, two handles on it, so to dig his basement. Now, you would think, well, a scoop and a team of horses to dig a basement? But where he was, was water. I had rubber boots on and walking through there and, and the, the mud was soupy from all the water in it. And you'd sink down, you know, over, pin over, not over top of your rubber boots, but almost. And it was hard walking because, you know, if you didn't hold your foot right in the bottom, you'd walk right out of your boots. But anyway, I helped him do that and then when he poured the basement he, I, i'm not sure who all he had helping him but it got to be my job to take a wheelbarrow around the top of the wall full of rocks and throw rocks down in with the concrete so it wouldn't take so much concrete to, to make the basement walls they didn't fall in so i presume it wasn't a bad idea and also with Lessons Gloria, I used to go there at night and say, get your guitars and play. And they, they really must enjoy playing and singing together because they would play and sing songs for me for two to three hours whenever I was there. I wasn't there every night, but I was there at least one night a week or maybe more sometimes. But I'd go there and and listen to them sing. I can't sing. I can't. Les tried to teach me how to play a guitar, but that didn't work either. So he just gave up very quickly. I don't blame him either. But anyway, it was it was uh, a good relationship I had with those two. And Les was and Hensley. They were both uh, like fathers to me almost. And uh, took, you know, washed out for me and stuff. So I really appreciated that part of the family there. And then after less, there's old. Uh, old married my first cousin through my mother's side of the family. And they had, I guess, five children, three girls and two boys. And... Unfortunately, Ob and Betty outlived two of their, their two sons, and I know that must hurt. I don't know how bad it hurts, but it had to hurt a lot. And and the last one was the oldest son. That he was well, four years ago or five years ago he died. I'm not sure. It hasn't been that long, but still he outlived his two children and. And that has always got to be a sore spot. Uh, Ob, never thought Ob had a sense of humor. Uh, I don't know why I didn't think he had a sense of humor. I presume it's, you know. Anyway, I was visiting of him about four years ago. And no, it'd be about six years ago. And He'd come in from mowing the lawn just before I got there. And he said, you know what? And I said, what? And he said, I was mowing the lawn. He said, oh, he had a big place he mowed. And he said, this woman 
stop the car and haul it over. Do you cut grass? And I said, well, I'm cutting this. And she said, well, how much do you get paid? And Hope said to her, well, the woman that I'm cutting this for lets me sleep with her at night. And, and he said, the woman just put the window up and drove away. He said, I was 80, I think he said he was 84 years old at the time. I said, somebody stupid enough to ask me <laughs> if I was going to cut grass for money. So I, like I said, I, it, it sort of changed my opinion all because I didn't think he had that much sense of humor in it. But obviously, there was quite a sense of humor. And you never had to worry about a conversation when you were with all that uh, he could talk you to death without even trying, I guess. Uh, I remember Les saying, because they worked as carpenters in Halifax together, and this one guy walked over to Les one day and said, that fellow there, he's your brother, isn't he? Yeah. He said, well, does he ever stop talking? And Les said, well, he was 30 months old before he said his first word, and he hasn't shut up since, so I guess he don't stop talking. <laughs> so I don't know whether... Either one of those states were, they were true, but I know when you go visit them, he would tell you stories about all the people he knew that were uh, older than me. Uh, they were like, I would say, his father's age, and he knew them. And he'd say, you knew so-and-so. And I said, well, I, I, re I know the name, but I didn't know him, you know. And, and he'd keep right on going and tell you all the stories about it. So, anyway, that's about all I can tell you. And while he had two grandsons that were twins, and they were the, uh, well, I guess because of his boy, one boy being, dying really young, these two boys, they got season passes to Mount Mar Martop and all this stuff. And they he bought them a car so they could drive back and forth to, Katy University went to university, but they had to agree not to take the car anywhere else, just drive back and forth with it. I presume they did it because he never ever took the car away from her or anything. So anyway, the next one down is Ruth. Now I went to, I started school in kindergarten and Ruth was finishing grade ten. And I can remember she sewed a dress by hand. And whoever was judging it found one place in the whole dress where she uh, missed, didn't miss a stitch. It was just a, like a, a double length between the stitches rather than, you know, the regular stitch you put in. And give her a bad mark. I mean, she should have got a full mark for it, and she did. And I can remember my grandmother saying, you know, like, she obviously she don't like us or whatever and uh, but anyway Ruth had a bad heart like my father she had the same problem I can remember she was in the hospital I never did go see her as far as that goes uh, I know my father and mother went and I don't know whether my grandfather and grandmother went or not I can't remember that all I can remember is that they at that time they didn't put a stint in where they could just keep feeding all your medicine through to one spot in your, but uh, they give you a needle every time you needed it. And she was so sick. If you ever seen the pictures of those uh, prisoners of war that were skinny, just not but skin and bone, well, that, when she came home in the hospital, that's what she looked like. And she was so sore, just to touch her, she would, cry because from all the needles they stuck into her while she was in the hospital but anyway she recovered and she tried to join the military now why she did that because she knew she had a bad heart they did looked at her and laughed i guess they thought you we're not going to take you you got a bad heart so anyway that meant that there was actually seven of the ten either tried or was called up for the military during the Second World War. And uh, 
Anyway, my parents were cloaks. They they went to Camp Gatestown in New Brunswick to see them, and I got pictures of the whole family here, the, uh, her and her husband and the eight kids, I think it is. So anyway, when, when, anyway, when we started coming home, if she was anywhere's handy and knew we were in Windsor, she would come and visit us. And for some reason, I had always liked her, you know, as sort of my favorite aunt at, when I was a kid. Now, why I did, I have no idea, because like I say, she was last year of school, grade 10, when I started kindergarten. But anyway, she always come and visit Carol and I at uh, Carol's parents' place where we would be staying and, you know, talk to us about the family and one thing or another. And it was only like a half hour visit, but she got there and took the effort to get there. So anyway, that's that's that part. The best part I know, somebody in her family is going to have to fill in an awful lot of gaps. I can remember, though, when she had the first baby, she was in New Brunswick. And the doctors there, after she had the baby, said, you women from Nova Scotia must be awful tough because there's no way you should survive that. And, of course, she went on to have a whole slew more. One of them was born at home that I remember. And uh, the doctor came and checked her out and said, well, we've got to take you to the hospital now. And she said, I'm not going to the hospital now. I've already had the baby. I don't have to go to the hospital. So that's the type of person she was. And so anyway, the, the last one on the line, what I remember uh, is, is Lena. Now, Lena, I don't know whether it was because she was a baby. Uh, but uh, she was, uh, she had a, a voice that raked on me. I don't know whether it bothered anybody else, but it did me. And once I left for Ontario, I, I didn't bother go and see her. Maybe once every three times I come home. And my wife said to me one day, how come you don't go see Lena? And I said, well, you know, like, her voice bothers me, what happened? Yeah, but she said, you're only going to see her an hour or so. Well, that opened my eyes. Yes, that is true. I'm only going to see her for now. I can put up with anything for an hour or so. So anyway, we started going to see her. And I found out at that time how nice of a person Lena was. And she had problems that uh, I, I I don't know what you call it, whether it was, uh, what do they call it? Uh, Anyway, she she was always on treatment for this and that and the other thing. And, and I, I don't know whether it was her nerves or whether, you know, what all it was. Because I wasn't close enough to get firsthand. I'd just seen her once a year. But we got going there and she would say, have dinner with me. And that was after Ralph passed away. And then she they start having her in homes so that, Somebody could take care of her. She was in Windsor. We would go to these, this place. And then she moved to New Brunswick, and her daughter lived up there. And uh, so it was just off the main highway where she was. Well, when I first started going there, I come on the old number two in New Brunswick and come across the bridge, found the place. I forget who gave me the direction, but whoever did, it was good direction. Went in and seen her. So then it got so that coming and going, I would drop in and see her, maybe 15 minutes or so, half hour, depending on how she was feeling. If she was not feeling good, well, you know, it wasn't much sense staying too long. But anyway, one year, I think it was old, said, they they moved Lena. I said, what? Well, so I said, well, give me the address. And so I went on my computer and chased down the address. And so I come off the exit off the main highway and I'm driving along. I said, this is the same way we come again. And then when I got to a, 
point in the road where it normally went left. I, it said go right, so I went right. And I drove by this house, and well, that's the house. But, you know, so then I had to back up and drive in the yard. And the man came out the door and said, who are you looking for? And I said, I'm looking for Lena Keo. And he said, well, she's not here, but her daughter is. She I walk in, never had met her daughter. Uh, I had met Brian, so I didn't meet the two girls. And I didn't meet the other boy either, but I met new Brian. So anyway, when I introduced myself, she said, oh, you're you're the cousin that got the same birthday as I got. I said, what? Yeah, she said, I was born December 27th, same as you. Well, I didn't know this at all. This was all news to me. And she showed her granddaughter was there with a baby. So she had a great granddaughter, I guess it was, and uh, had a long talk. And so then she said, I'll take you over. And I said, you don't have to. I know the way. Oh, well, so I got to go see her anyway. So we all went over, her, her and Carol and I, just, we went over in the cars and went in and seen Lena. So, but anyway, that's, you know, there's, I stop and think how many first cousins I got that I have never met. Uh, I've met uh, in Arthur's family. Well, I met the three oldest ones, the first wife, but the five from the second wife, the only ones I met was Nicky and Lorraine. And Hensley, I met him. Uh, Hensley and Lorraine off in uh, Vancouver Island. We went out there with Roley and Expo. So went over there and seen them then. But I never did see the other girl or David. David phoned me once. Never got good instructions to where he lived. I know the general area, and it's not far away from where we are. But anyway, so like I said, I only met Sadie's kids a couple of times. Then you go to Hanny's kids while well, they grew up, and I left town, but I knew them both. And uh, Hanny's, uh, yeah, Hanny's the two boys. And then Harold didn't have any, and Hensley, I knew all his children. Uh, And uh, Les, I knew his two girls. <coughs> now, Hope's family, I didn't know. I met Diane when she came to Ontario for a while. And I met the one girl since Hope and Betty had been getting older, and she comes and takes care of. But I, I never met the two boys or anything. So... And the, the whole whole slew in the family that I haven't met. So I hope very much that this reunion will bring a lot of them together. Because uh, on Facebook, I see a couple of Ruth's kids on there. But uh, the boys aren't around. I don't know where they are. Never hear anybody mention them. Uh, there was a picture on there once, and I asked, you know, if that was the whole family and the, the brothers and sisters, and and the answer was yes. So, but uh, that's all I've ever seen of the boys. <coughs> I remember uh, the oldest girl, Rosemary. Rosemary. I, I met her, but she was only like two years old at that time. So, and I met a couple of the boys at that time too. But uh, there was no way I'd recognize them today. So anyway, that's what I know about the family. The original ten. Uh, you got a lot of stuff about some of the the next generation down, but 
If anybody goes to do my family tree, I got a whole slew. I got four kids, nine grandchildren, and 14 great-grandchildren so far. I think I run out of grandchildren. But uh, anyway, that's the end. This, and I look at my machine here, and it says I'm almost to 56 minutes. So it's time for a commercial break to fill up the rest of the hour. I don't know how I'm going to get this to Faye, but David's going to have to figure out a way. So thank you for listening, and thank you if you type any of this up, Faye. So God bless.